All right, today we're going to talk about line integrals. So this is uh, broken up into a few sections. We're going to review a little bit, and then we're going to introduce them, talk about a new differential, and then talk about the fact that we can do line integrals over two different types of uh, things, scalar functions and vector uh, fields. All right, so to start a kind of warm up, and we're going to review integration a little bit. and some of the notations and ideas and concepts we've talked about so far. So we've we've a big part of introducing multiple integration was to related to the fact that the area, if you integrate a region uh, over a region, you integrate the area differential, you get the area. And the reason for this is, you know, uh, the integral is shaped like an S for a reason. It's meant to represent a sum because it's related to a, always uh, a Riemann sum. Uh, in the limit. And then we're used to DA being like the area differential. And we think of that as a small amount of area. So if you kind of put this notation together, what it actually says is if, okay, well, let's give ourselves a region. The region R is the rectangular region with X varying from zero to one and Y varying from two to three. And now if we think about this notation, it kind of says sum up. So the integral sum signs, sum up over the region R, small bits of area, the area differential. Okay. And then we added into this idea, we said, all right, well, it's uh, what happens if you, you integrate a surface over a region? So let z equals f of x, y be a surface over our region that's defined over our region r. And then this notation kind of says sum up over our region r, small amounts of area times, uh, the a being the small amounts of area, our area differential, times those function values, those out those outputs of the function, the heights. And that's how we came up with the volume underneath a surface over a region. That's a double good goal. The idea that area of the base times height is equal to volume. So what about the length of a line segment? It might feel like we're going backwards and we kind of are. So, but just bear with me. We're gonna talk about the length of a line segment from one zero to four zero. If you're thinking, hey, those are on the uh, X axis, it's not a coincidence. If we integrate from one to four, um, dx, we could think of this as kind of the length differential. We've saw, talked about this a little bit before. Then we get x and we're gonna evaluate it from four to one. So we get four minus one length of three. And, and anybody could have sketched a picture and come up with the same conclusion, but we used integration to do it. So now if we take and apply similar notation that we were talking about above uh, where we're integrating over a region instead of specific um, limits of integration and we name the interval that line segment we're talking about, we name it the interval x varying from one to four. Then we can kind of replace, oops, I meant to have a dx in there. Sorry about that, let's, let's put one in there. Then we can kind of replace this notation as the integral from one to four of, d, of the length differential dx is the integral over our interval of the length differential dx uh, and still get the same answer of three. So why, did I, why am I blathering on about this? Well we're going to do something different. We're going to integrate not over uh, an interval as we're used to with single integrals, but rather we're gonna integrate functions over a curve. And in this case, the curve that we're talking about is just a, a straight interval, but we're gonna allow that, that I, that interval, that curve to be a curve in the plane or a curve in space, and then integrate whatever function we, we want. So that's, an that's uh, a warm up before we introduce line integrals. Okay, so line integrals involve integrating function over a domain which happens to be a curve. Um, similar to Calc 1, integrating over a line segment, just getting a little bit more complicated. Uh, Calc 1, we always integrated over a interval, a line segment on the X axis or Y axis depending. So multiple integrals have allowed us to integrate functions of several variables over regions uh, in the plane or in space, but not over a curve. And so line intervals, integrals rather, we're gonna let C represent a smooth curve. And then the integral of F over C is given by, or rather notated as the integral over the curve C, uh, F ds. So what's ds? I'm like, well, let's take a look at that and see if we can uh, convince ourselves that it makes sense. So the arc length differential here is what we're gonna be talking about. 
So let C be a parabola, y is equal to x squared. Let it be in the plane uh, where we're interested in just letting x vary from negative one to one. And then let this uh, surface f of xy be one minus cosine of x times sine of x. And there's a trimmed off picture of the surface with the dotted line below it being the, the curve in the plane that we're gonna integrate over. And then the image of that, those input lines on the surface itself using those points in the plane as our input. So our goal here is to find the area, quote, under the surface of F and over the curve. So kind of the area of the fence is what I like to call this. And so that kind of looks like that. If you strip away the surface and, and just leave the curve uh, in space on the surface, and then the sort of related input curve as dotted lines in the, in the plane, you see on the left that, okay, we've got an area, a surface area, if you will, underneath that curve above the, uh, X, Y plane. So how do we actually do that? Well, first let's kind of estimate this. And if we drew in some rectangles, we could say, all right, well, each of those rectangles has area of length times width. And so the area of the fence is given by the line integral over C, the curve C of F of S DS. What does that actually mean? Well, we were saying we're gonna estimate this by summing up the, you know, the height of these things is given, seems related to the function you know, that surface. And then the width of them is, I guess I shouldn't have used L's there, that didn't, that was unclear. So the height is defined as, you know, those are the heights, uh, different color green maybe. And then the width is given by, I'm, I'm really messing this up. Let's, let's give it another go. Okay, so the height is defined, oh man, sometimes. All right, so the height's defined here as the vertical height of these things, and the width is defined by these. Right? So the height is related to the function value, as we can see, it's kind of uh, above the input point on the, cur on the curve in the plane on the, the surface, that curve on the surface. Um, and then what is the width related to? Well, we drew rectangles, but those rectangles are meant to approximate the actual arc length on that, that input curve in the plane. And so if we say, all right, let's just put a few points here. These are the points on the, uh, on the height of the, our, our curve. Remember our curve is resting on that surface F in space. Let's get that labeled better. So this curve F of C. That's the image of every point on our curve C uh, on the surface of our F surface in space. So what, if, uh, what do these little dots represent? Well, those little dots relate to three input points, we'll call them little c, c1, c2, and c3, and c4. And so each of these heights, uh, this is a point c1 comma f of little c1 comma, oh, that's confusing because c1 is, is x and y. Let me try again. All right, c1 is made up of, of uh, x and a y value. But this height, this height, we're just gonna label it as the output of the function at that height, f of c1. So now we've got that, okay, those heights can be the function evaluated at our input point. And we're just labeling those input points. And then the, the base of those rectangles, the width of them, if you will, that's given by the change in our arc length using s as the arc length. So if we take this in a limit and we, we, let, we uh, let this partition be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, we get more and more rectangles to estimate the area onto this curve, we're gonna get the exact area by letting that arc length change go to zero. And this should look similar to every definition of an integral that we've seen so far, either letting the area differential go to zero or the volume differential go to zero or dx, the length differential go to zero. Now we're just working in terms of the arc length. So the area of the fence can be given by the line integral over the curve of the function uh, with respect to the area or uh, the arc length differential. So this notation looking just strictly at the left-hand side of that equation informally kind of the integral means to sum up over our curve C this time, um, the function values F of S times small little changes in arc length DS getting a whole bunch of little rectangles, adding them all up and getting the exact area underneath that curve over, underneath that surface over that curve. 
So here's a nice applet, which kind of illustrates that. Okay, so this thing is loaded and we've got ourselves, oops, well, well, you know what? I didn't realize that happened, but that was pretty cool. So we'll just roll with it. Okay, so we're interested in, if we look straight down, we wanna find the area of the fence using that curve in the plane as our input points uh, over underneath the surface. And, and so right now we've got n is equal to two, two rectangles approximating that using the logic that we did before. Okay, now we've got seven rectangles approximating it. All right, that looks a little bit cleaner. Definitely looks like we're getting a better and better approximation of the area. And then as you let n run off to infinity, you're eventually gonna arrive at exactly the exact true area under the curve and above, under the surface above that curve, the area of the fence. All right, so here's another, uh, he's kind of in conclusion of this. Uh, I didn't actually calculate this because this integral is really hard and requires just numerical method. And so we just use some technology to solve it. Now it looks like my, uh, my typing got cut off, but the answer is about 2.17. And if we look at that saying, hey, like here is a, a one by one unit of area, we kind of say, okay, that seems fairly reasonable that since this is one and that's negative one and that's one, that this, this blue area seems like, okay, it could be about two. and. Uh, Here's a really nice applet that you can use to check your work and calculate and just kind of see some nice graphs and a nice visual intuit intuition of the area under, under the fence. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so hopefully that was moderately convincing that the arc length differential, uh, ds represents the arc length differential. Here, s is the arc length parameter that we've seen before. It's defined as s of t is equal to the integral from zero to t of the magnitude of, of our function, our vector valued function r primed uh, and then integrated. And so the arc length differential ds, if you think about it, just kind of fundamental applying the calculus, doing the math on this, if you will, will end up being that. And so what we're gonna see on the next slide is that you can pick up this expression. If you parameterize a curve, you can replace that differential with this. And uh, well, if you're parameterizing the curve with R, then that's now gonna be F of R of T, but we'll see that on the next slide. And that's gonna end up high being how we actually calculate these things. So uh, informally, if we parameterize C with uh, some curve, some vector valued curve where the X and the Y component are given by X of T and Y of T, then we can place X and Y in our F function with X of T and Y of T and our integral becomes substituting in, making that substitution. We can relate the differential with this expression. But if we're gonna do that, we've made a substitution, we better rate late our function in terms of that same parameterization. So some facts about line integrals before we go much further. Line integrals are integrals or functions to be integrated is, are being integrated over uh, along a curve or a path or a line. Sometimes they're called curve or path integrals. Um, the function may be, to be integrated may be a scalar function or a vector field. We'll start with scalar and we'll see vector fields later. So comparing this to what we've done so far, before this point, we've integrated scalar fields, uh, scalar functions over integral, intervals rather, that was just single variable calculus, taking y is equal to f of x, whoops, f of x dx and you know, integrating it over an interval. And then in multivariable calculus, we learned how to integrate over regions in the plane or spaces, double or triple integrals. But we've never ever integrated over a curved a domain of integration that is a curve, uh, whether that curve is in the plane or the space. Uh, and we haven't integrated vector fields yet either. But we have done vector value functions. It's kind of similar. All right, line integrals over scalar functions. So start with the definition. A line integral over of a scalar function f, in either case, let c be a smooth curve parameterized by r with t varying between a and b, and r has continuously differentiable component functions. Then, if we're working with a planar curve, uh, in that case, our curve is completely contained in an xy plane, then r of t is just gonna be x of t and y of t, and we're going to 
uh, relate our integrand as f of x of t, r of t, evaluate it f at our, using our parameterization of our curve, and then relate our differential ds is equal to the magnitude of the derivative of our par parameterization uh, dt. Very, very similar. If you have a curve in space, you're just going to have that extra z component, and everything else is going to be the same. So line integrals involving parameterization, or rather line integrals do involve parameterization of the domain of integration. So our domain of integration is not going to be a region or an a interval just in a single variable calculus, but rather it's going to be a curve in space. Um, and you can talk about this in plane if you just set z equal to zero. So let's take a quick moment to uh, review some common parameterizations. Well, as we saw earlier in this course, vector equation for a curve in space is given by r of t is equal to x of t, y of t, and z of t as the component functions for x, y, and z respectively. And you can think of t as time with t being equal zero being a kind of initial starting point, and then it'll give you a direction of travel from there. So here's a common way to parameterize a curve, y is equal to f of x. It's to replace x with t and then make the y coordinate f of t. So if we were to write this out, we would have, um, here we go. If we were to write this out, we have R of T is equal to T comma F of T. And that'll give you a parameterization for any curve of the format Y is equal to F of X. So let's take a look at this. If we have Y is equal to X to the third power and we want to parameterize it uh, from one, the point one, one to the end point 327. Well, let's replace X with T and then replace y with t to the third power. And then you letting t vary from one to three, since, you know, why did we choose one to three? Well, x is our input variable of our original function. So that's where we got, if we let x is equal to t, well, then we'll just let t vary from one to three. And that should give us um, a parameterization of our curve from that initial point to that endpoint. So let's check it. At t equals to one, we're going to evaluate x of t and y of t at 1, and we're going to get 1, 1, 1, 1, the exact point we hoped, our initial point. And when t is equal to 3, again, evaluating x of 3 and y of 3, you get 327, which is our terminal point, and we've done it. So I don't have it typed out on here, but if we were to write this out in the notation uh, that we saw before, we'd use r of t is equal to our t component function, our x component function, x of t is just t, and our y component function, y of t is t to the third power. Okay, so a line segment in space with initial point P and terminal point Q. Well, this is just the equation of uh, vector valued equation of lines in space that we've seen before. You start off with your initial point vector to initial point P to get onto the line, and then you travel in the direction of the line, which is given by vector PQ. And letting T vary from zero to one and multiplying or adding on to the initial vector P, a multiple of PQ, at time equals zero, you'll be at your initial point P. And at time equals one, you'll be at terminal point Q because you'll have traveled from P to Q. So here's an example of line segment. Say we want to parameterize the line segment from zero, negative one, negative six to negative five, one, negative two. Then we'll do the necessary calculations. PQ is equal to negative five, two, four. And then putting it all together, just plugging things in, you know, P is our initial point. And so we'll go to a vector to that initial point. And then PQ, we calculated and substituted in. Putting it all together, you have your three component functions. Uh, X of T is just negative five T. Y of T is one plus two T. And Z of T is equal to negative six plus four T. Circles can be parameterized with basically what looks like um, polar coordinates, and in fact it is. I'm just using t instead of theta. You can use theta if you like. It's absolutely okay. It means the same thing. You got anti-clockwise there, uh, the regular way, putting the x component as cosine and the y component as sine. And then similarly, if you wish to reverse the order, you could uh, put sine to be the x component and cosine to be the y component. Ellipses, similar to circles, just with a little bit different. I'll, uh, you know, we'll just leave these. You can look them up. Um, all right, line integral of a scalar function. Let's talk about the method. How are we actually going to calculate these things? Well, first step is to parameterize our curve. Uh, and yep, 
use R of T or whatever. I mean, I use R of T always uh, for my notation. And then relate the differentials and then relate the integrand uh, using our parameterization. Since we're going to use those kind of as the inputs, we better relate them to the way we parameterize the inputs of the curve and then put it all together, make the substitutions and calculate it out. So while I said that is, you know, it's a lot. So let's work through an example. So let's uh, do the line integral uh, over the curve C of x squared z ds um, over C being the line segment from those two points that we just saw. Spoiler alert, we're going to borrow the work that we just did. We're going to parameterize C using the parameterization we just did. I forgot to add 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1, which is really important. Those are the, going to be the limits of our integration. Sorry, that'll disappear, and we'll bring it back when we need it. So next step, I like to relate the differentials. And you can, you can relate the integrand first if you want to, but as long as you do all these steps, uh, they don't, these, well, you always have to parameterize the curve first, but steps two and three can be reversed. And then step four, integrate has got to be, got to have done everything else before that. All right, beside the point. So we have R right there. So taking the derivative of R is straightforward, taking the derivative of the X component, Y component, and Z component, respectively. The derivative of the X component, negative five T has derivative of negative five, and then derivative of the Y component, negative one plus two t has derivative two, et cetera. Finding the magnitude of this, you know, square root, sum of the squares of the components gives us three root five. And now we'll take and evaluate our integrand. And here it might be actually helpful to write that this is really gonna be f of x of t, y of t, z of t. We're gonna replace x, y, and z with our parameterization for x, y, and z, which comes from r. OK, so x becomes negative 5. Uh, whoops, that one's too long. Negative 5t. y becomes, I got a little wild up there negative one plus two t, and z becomes negative six plus four t. And then since we are substituting in for x squared here, we're gonna use negative five t squared for x, and then we're gonna multiply that by z here. We're gonna substitute in negative six plus four t for z. And then once you have all those pieces, it's time to put the puzzle together. And it would have been helpful if I typed out, but I have limited room on the slide, so let's just write it out. We want to have integral from a to b, f of r of t, so our function related to our parameterization, and then times the magnitude of the derivative of our parameterization, dt. Okay, so our integrand comes from here, right there. And now to relate the differentials, we relate the differentials from up here. Not totally bad. Yeah, I'll add that in there. And then this, if you look at it, this just becomes a single variable calculus integral, which we've done lots and lots and lots of. So I admitted the steps there, but it's relatively quick and painless to verify just a couple power rules um, that you're going to get an answer of negative 75 root 5. OK, let's do a second example. Let's integrate over the curve C, where C is the right half of the circle of radius 7 centered at the origin. And we're integrating x squared plus y squared with respect to the arc length differential. And we want the origin traveled in the anti-clockwise direction. So they've, they've told us a little bit about how to, uh, how to come up with this parameterization. So first things first, let's parameterize our curve. Well, this smells of polar coordinates. And so I'm going to say, just use polar coordinates with radius 7. Circle of radius 7 centered at the origin is going to be r is equal to 7. And so your x and your y with polar coordinates replacing r with 7. Polar coordinates, is, as we know, is x is equal to r cosine of theta and y is equal to r sine of theta. So just replacing that with 7 gives us our parameterization. And notice it's of a single variable here. We've got r of theta is equal to 7, the vector 7 cosine of theta, 7 sine of theta. And we want to let theta vary. Whoops, I forgot a less than or equal to. 
less than or equal to pi over two to pi over two. Why? Because we only want this half of our circle, the right hand half of it with x greater than zero. So we're gonna let our angle vary from negative pi over two to pi over two. Okay, now it's time to relate the differential. We have our parameterization. So we will take the derivative of it, which looks like I made a typo. That is negative seven sine theta and seven cosine of theta. All right, with that fixed, we're ready to move on and it'll disappear. Okay, so uh, calculating the magnitude of that is a, an exercise that we can do. We'll get the length of seven. And so now let's relate our integrand in terms of our parameterization. So we're gonna substitute in for x, we're gonna use uh, seven cosine of theta. And for y, we're gonna use seven sine of theta. And if we go ahead and make those substitutions in here, well, we've done this before, we'll get seven squared uh, cosine squared of theta plus seven squared sine squared of theta. Factor out your 49 and you got 49 times one there, cosine squared plus sine squared. And that's how we get 49. So putting this all together, our entire integrand we just saw becomes 49. So you replace that. And uh, to relate the differential, we have seven. Uh, I should have made that. I should have made those theta where I just highlighted, but that's okay. We can leave it like that. We're using the variable theta instead of t. And then your limits of integration relate to your parameterization as well. Calculate that out, and you'll see you get 343 pi. So even though we had a uh, orientation, a direction that they told us to set the parameterization up in that last example, um, independence of parameterization, line integrals of a scalar function will be the same regardless of the parameterization chosen as long as you trace the curve once. We see that, so we're just gonna list out some properties of line integrals of scalar functions here to close out this section before we talk about line integrals over vector fields. We have the usual integration properties and I'll let you know, look those up in the textbook. But if you, if K is a constant, I didn't write that, but K is a constant, you can pull it out in front of the integral and then deal with just the variable stuff. This one's kind of new though. Uh, line integrals are piecewise smooth additive. That means that if your curve is composed of two or more piecewise smooth curves, then you can break up the line integral and add together the results over those curves. So what does this, what do I mean here? So say you have, uh, planar curve here, and and uh, you're integrate you're interested in integrating over some kind of a maybe a half circle, and then the line segment that connects the endpoints of these half circles. If this is our curve, and it's possible for curves to be closed like this to have uh, the same initial and endpoint, then you could think of this half circle as C1, and then the line segment as C2. And then to do the line integral over this entire curve, naming it C, you could just do the individual line integrals over the two pieces of the curve, if you will, and then add together the results. Okay, so now it's time to talk about line integrals over vector fields. Here, uh, let's start off, we just kind of said that um, line integrals are independent of parameterization. So if you choose a different parameterization for your curve, it'll give you the same result if you're integrating a scalar function, something that outputs a number. But now we're gonna start integrating vector fields. So we're gonna integrate things that output a vector. Here, orientation of the curve that you're integrating over matters. And an oriented curve has a defined trajectory. In other words, it has a direction of travel along the curve. And what that means is, Take, a, for example, the unit circle. We could uh, parameterize it anti-clockwise is what we're used to using cosine for x and sine for y, but we could also parameterize it clockwise by interchanging those two. And if you do, and you'll get a different result if you integrate a vector field over these curves with different parameterizations. 
So orientation matters. Um, specific parameterization, however, does not. As, as long as you parameterize your curve in the correct orientation, think of it as direction going forward or, or backwards, whatever you're told to do on that curve, um, you can choose whatever parameterization you like uh, as long as you're using the correct orientation. So in general, when we do choose parameterizations, we try and choose ones that seem like they'll make the math work out nicely. Okay, so the definition of a line integral over a vector field is let's set it up. We got F as a vector field. It has continuous component functions. It's defined over a smooth curve C. And we're gonna parameterize C with R of T as usual. And we're gonna let uh, T, as we've seen before, use it as a unit tangent where it's R primed over the magnitude. It's just the uh, first derivative scaled by its length. That makes it a unit. And then the line integral over our vector field F along our curve C is given by the integral of C F dot dr, which is equal to the line integral of C where we take the vector field and dot it with that unit tangent vector. And so dr is really a notation to sort of represent this. Um, but just pause for a second and think about this. What's going to happen when we take uh, a vector field, which is a vector equation, and dot it with a unit tangent vector, another vector? Well, we, we know that the dot product of two vectors is a number. And so this is actually going to reduce down into, once you've done this math, it'll reduce down into the case of integrating a scalar function, because you'll be integrating the dot product will be a scalar function. Remember, scalar, just a fancy word for uh, outputs a number. So evaluating a line integral over vector fields, what we do is that this is the primary way we see and write um, line integrals over vector fields. What we do is we, again, evaluate our vector field at our parameterization. And then to relate the differentials, it turns out that we're going to uh, do the derivative of our parameterization. So general method for integrating uh, line integrals over vector fields, we parameterize C with our, our, our vector valued function R as usual. We relate the differentials as dr is equal to R prime T dt, and then relate the integrand under our parameterization. I just use dot, dot, dot there to say, hey, the same thing is true if you have one or two or even more inputs. So putting it all together, you see there is, this is how we're actually gonna calculate uh, line integrals over vector fields. So let's work an example here. Let's start. All right, so our uh, field that we're interested in is gonna be z negative four, uh, z in the x component, negative four y in the y component and negative x in the z component. And our curve is gonna be given by sine of t, comma cosine of t, comma t, and x, y, and z components respectively, letting t vary from zero to pi. So we're given the parameterization here. So that's good. We're done with that department. Our limits of integration are going to be zero to pi. Now it's time to relate the differentials. So we will take the derivative of that parameterization. Derivative of sine in the x component is cosine. Derivative of cosine in the y component is negative sine. And derivative of t in the z component is one. So now let's uh, do the integrand under our parameterization. So again, we're replacing x, the x component, which is z, with the z component from our parameterization. Similarly, what are we trying to, we're trying to turn negative 4y. Well, y is cosine of t, and so this becomes negative 4 cosine of t. And last but not least, in the z component, we have negative x. Well, for that x, we're going to replace it with sine of t, and so we get negative sine of t in our z component. Now, I like to take it further sometimes and actually uh, tidy up the entire integrand, because, uh, oh, I'm going to flip back here a couple steps. We're going to need f of r dotted with r primed. And so why don't we just go ahead and simplify that before we stuff it into our integral. 
All right. So f of r dotted with r prime. I think I have to write this. Yep. I'll try not to room, run out of room here. What do we have? We have, well, f of r is right there above that. So t comma negative four cosine of t comma negative sine of t. And we're going to dot that with our derivative, which is up here. Cosine of t, sine of t, comma one. Now taking this dot product, we have t times cosine of t plus negative four cosine of t. Now we're multiplying the y components together. It's hard to write and say the same thing. I just wrote a y. Multiplying the y components together, we get negative four cosine of t times sine of t. And then multiplying the z components, we have negative sine of t times one. So cleaning this all up, we have t cosine of t plus, oops, let's make that a minus. Let's make that minus four cosine of t times sine of t minus sine of t. And that's gonna be our entire integrand there. There it is. This is the entire integrand expression. So on the next page, let's go ahead and put that all together. All right, so putting everything we know together so far, this equals, we're gonna go, our integral is gonna go from zero to pi, and we're gonna integrate t cosine of t dt. Oh, wait a minute, not yet. Minus four cosine of t sine of t minus sine of t dt. Now we're ready. Okay, so this part is gonna require integration by parts uv minus integral of v du, choosing u to be t, which gets nicer under differentiation. We have du is equal to dt, and then choosing dv to be everything else, uh, cosine of t dt. We get that v is equal to sine of t, and then doing this integration, we get t sine of t uv minus the integral of sine of t, which is plus cosine of t when evaluated. This second uh, piece of the interval requires a u substitution. You can do it any way you like to, but it works pretty nicely with u is equal to sine of t. Well, I guess you have to do it a certain way. Then you just have directly a direct substitution. Du is cosine of t dt. And that turn integrates into minus four times one half u squared, which is sine squared of t. Last but not least, going back to the black pen, integral of negative sine of t is positive cosine of t has derivative of negative sine of t. Evaluate this rig from t is equal to zero to pi, leave that to you is four. And I know I skipped a few steps there, but there's an outline. Um, with that outline, it's uh, doable. I think I said negative four and didn't write it. It's definitely supposed to be negative four. All right, so there's your line integral of this scalar function, or this vector field rather, over the curve given there. Okay, so let's talk about some properties of line integrals over vector fields. Opposite direction gives you opposite result. What do I mean by that? Say you have an oriented curve C, and then you call negative C the same curve, but oriented in the opposite direction. That's not negative one times C, that's a notation. That means that our curve is oriented in the opposite direction. Well, then the results are gonna be opposite as well. If you have a positive result on the left, you're gonna get a negative result without even having to do the math. Okay, uh, again, we have the usual integral properties and those are listed in the textbooks and I'll, I'll leave those, but I just illustrated with the same one we saw before that if you have a constant, it doesn't really affect anything. So you can pull it out of the integral and then deal with just the variable quantities. And again, similar to what we saw with uh, integrating line integrals over scalar, field, scalar functions, um, they're piecewise smooth addition additive again when you're integrating a vector field. 
Okay, so flux and circulation. Let F be a vector field and C be a smooth curve with parametrization R is equal to X of T, Y of T. Um, and then a normal vector to R can be found by taking our normal vector N to be negative Y of T for the X component and X of T for the Y component. So the flux of F across C is given by line integral over C of F dot N, capital N DS, where capital N DS refers to this over here. Our field evaluated our parameterization dotted with a normal vector to our parameterization. The circulation of F over a closed curve C is our usual line integral over a vector field, but there's this a little circular symbol here uh, in the middle of the integral. And that's used to denote that we have a closed curve. And a closed curve is just, you got an open curve, goes from end point or initial point to end point, call this A, call this B. But for a closed curve, you start at point A and you travel a wee bit, and then you end up right back at point A, has the same end point and initial point. Whereas a non-closed curve is A to B on the left, closed curve is on the right. So special line integrals. Sometimes we encounter line integrals with different differentials, things that look like the integral over curve C of F dx instead of having the arc length differential in there. And so how do we deal with these? Well, we do what we usually do, evaluate F using our parametrization as usual, and then use our parametrization to relate the differentials. So for instance, if you have R of T is equal to X of T, Y of T, then, dx is equal to x prime of t dt, applying the chain rule from calc one. So let's try one. Let's do uh, the integral over c of x dy plus y dx. And what this actually means is, I'm gonna erase this. It'll, it'll disappear when I, I change the slide anyway. Sure, you can break it up into two if you want to, but as you'll see, it, it there's a reason we don't need two integrals. It, it, Everything comes out in the wash and works pretty nicely. So just bear with me. Let's give it a go. Our curve is going to be y is equal to e to the x, and we're going to let x vary from 0 to 1. Whoops, I guess I had a blank slide there. So let me clean this up. OK, so we're just going to do this one all from scratch. So the first thing we need to do is we need to parametrize c. And so since we're given y is equal to f of x format, we're going to say, OK, r of t a relatively quick way to parameterize this is going to be t is x. There's your input. And since x varied from 0, 1, t is going to vary from 0 to 1. And then we want y to be e of x. Well, we replaced x with t. So y is going to be e to the t power, comma, 0 less than or equal to t, less than or equal to 1. OK, so now I see that both of my integrals here have dy and dx. So I'm going to choose, before I relate the integrand, I'm going to relate the differentials. OK, so what do we have? We have x is equal to t, and y is equal to e to the t, or x of t and y of t, if you like. And from these expressions, we can directly calculate dx and dy. So dx is 1 dt. Derivative of t with respect to t is 1. Derivative of e to the t with respect to t dy is equal to e to the t dt. OK, so that, that looks like a pretty straightforward thing. We're going to be able to replace dx with dt directly and dy with e to the t power dt. So let's try and I think we're ready to put this all together. I'm going to relate the integrand while we, we put it all together. All right, ready? So our integral is integral over cx dy plus y dx. There we go. All right, so our parametrization here calls for limits of integration from 0 to 1, letting t vary. I'm going to, I'm going to rethink this. I want to go vertical. Equals integral from 0 to 1. OK, so what does x become? Well, under our substitution, x is equal to t. So we can directly substitute t in there. What about dy? Run out of markers, probably. 
Well, dy is e to the t times dt. So we'll replace that with e to the t dt uh, plus, all right, so now let's, let's worry about y. y is going to become e to the t, e to the t power. And last but not least, we're ready for dx. And dx is just directly dt. OK, so now that seems a little bit redundant to have kind of two, uh, two dt's in there. So look, what this integral actually becomes is t e to the t power plus e to the t dt. All right, so this is just a straightforward integral that we've seen before. Maybe not entirely straightforward, because this is going to require integration by parts. Again, if you choose u is equal to t like we did before, it's going to tidy up and it's going to work out nicely. Integration by parts gives us t e to the t power minus integral of e to the t dt, which is just e to the t. And then, well, this integral, that's a piece of cake. What does derivative e to the t? e to the t does. Negative e to the t plus e to the t, those things simplify away. So we just have to evaluate the expression t e to the t from t equals to 0 to 1. And that's going to give us 1 e to the 1 minus 0, which is just e. And we finished it. And that brings us to the end of our discussion of line integrals.